Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is the podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT to discuss their lives, their journeys and their ambitions with the greatest motorsporting event in the world and the greatest motorsporting event commentator, analyst, podcaster, Steve Plater. You sat right next to me again. Hello. I thought it was for my looks. Those as well. I was getting around to that. I was getting around to that. So we're yeah. still on the Isle of Man. We're still in the uh, the hotel. So if you're listening to this, it's not going to sound any different. But if you're watching this, it's gonna, it's not going to have the same zhuzh as we have in the uh, the studio. It'll still be a good listen. Um, you brought your bike over as well, didn't you? Is this is this a comeback? Yeah, no, I bought it last year, mate. Listen, I've been so busy and pinging from pillar to post. We've been at the, been at the Oldham Park test for all mm-hmm. the British Superbike stuff. And a lot of TT riders there as well. So I've kind of had to pack up there and get over to Liverpool Ferry really quick. So I thought, you know what? There's no better way than get on the bike and not get caught in traffic. Do you still take a lap in though when you're um, when you're on the bike? Yeah, well we're down in Ramsey, so off the ferry and you're doing half a lap anyway. Yeah, I suppose. Um, so that's first half. But unfortunately at the moment they are doing some work on the mountain, so we mm-hmm. don't get to do a full lap. So we battles and forwards on the on the main part. But the answer is yes. Yeah. I'll just go and do some bits and bobs, have a look. Uh, not try and go fast, but have a look right. at any resurfacing, any repair, and just see what's going on for yeah. a bit of insight when we get doing the TT work. So. Um, I guess today, Josh Brooks, back at the TT. We saw him at the TT last year, but he came as a spectator. I think he was helping out in one of the, the pit garage, uh, the pit stops as well. Um, what do we think we're going to get out of him? Do you know what? He's rejuvenated. He's, mm. he's uh, leading the British Championship at the moment. The fabulous it. first meeting at Silverstone at the time we're talking now. Um, doing, doing a great job. I think he's got a bee in his bonnet and he wants to go well. Um, obviously... He's got a great teammate, a very competitive teammate, so he can sit in the shadows a little bit. He was very fast on the Norton, his fastest lap he's ever done, and I think he's going to go much faster this year. Yeah, there's no there's no real pressure on him. No. Nope. Because of Pete Pete's stature there, that Pete's there to win. Josh is clearly Josh is wanting to win, but the onus is on Pete to, to take that bike to victory so he can just slowly get back into it in the best by far the best team in the paddock. To answer your question, I think we'll be seeing Josh Brooks on the podium for the first time in 2012. I didn't even ask, but thank you for supplying that information. Let's get him on. All right, Josh Brooks, 131 mile an hour personal best fastest lap, fastest Aussie ever to lap the TT course. You've come and you've gone and you've come and you've gone and now you're back again. Before we get into the whole story of Josh Brooks and uh, and how you got into motorcycling. Let's fast forward to the last time you were on that TT grid. We always ask the, f- the same question first time around. So you're lining up, you've gone through no man's land, mm-hmm. you sat there, you get that hand grasping your shoulder, you wait for that flag to drop, whether it be practice or whether it be in the race. What emotions, what feelings are going through your mind, if any at all, before you set off down Glen Crutchery Road? Well, for me, the, the tap on the shoulder is like the moment of, of relief because all the way up to that point there's um nervous energy stress and anxiety and all these feelings everyone has around you and that sort of like leeches from you know the people you're friends with to the crowd that all that 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 tension and energy kind of like migrates into you and then you carry that all the way up to that point and then when you, you get the tap and, and you're away it's like, ah, oh, you know, it's complete. Everything just goes. Every, yeah, it's just a release of all that pressure and tension and energy. And you think, well, I'm just riding my bike. That's what I've always done. This is, this is easy. This is, this is something I know. It's not like they're asking you to stand up and do public speaking, which, you know, you have good reason to be nervous about. You're just riding your bike. That's what you love doing and it's what you've always done. So you, you feel most comfortable and most at ease and most, yeah, um, without pressure at that in that moment so up to the point where you take off it's, it's it's stress and anxiety and then after that point it's bliss it's it's strange that the most dangerous part of all that is where you feel the most relief and stress-free but yeah. going up to it but you know that each and every time you go up and let that clutch out it all calms down yet you still can't somehow figure out how to not get nervous up to that to that yeah, point Do you think the it, nerves are good for a rider to to keep them focused I don't know if it's good. I mean, I'd, I'd prefer not to have them if there was an option. Chilled. If yeah, but um, I think it's just it's just natural, isn't it? Everybody has it, but I think some people have it more than others. Like I've always had nervous energy before anything that I've been you know proud to do. You know, so like even like a swimming race at 
primary school you know when you're standing there just about to step up to the blocks and jump in you're thinking oh can i beat you know billy next to me and can, will i swim good and will i be mm-hmm. fast you know that's just it's just all these ideas running through your head and you want to you've got your own expectations and what you want to achieve and you want to make sure you don't let anyone down or yourself or you know make a mistake and look foolish or anything you know I mean, it's all these things going through your head and I think it's natural to have that nervous energy. I think everybody would have it. So is that why you wouldn't get in the water yesterday down at Laxon Beach with a, with, with a Manx blue tip? Because you're scared no. of getting your backside kicked. No, no, that was just purely because I hate cold water. But. <laughs> so um, just just talking there, you know, kind of pre going through no man's land, is that something you dislike, the build up to that? You know, obviously all the handshaking and the pats on the back is that is that added pressure before you run through there is it nah like in in general i don't i feel like i'm a pretty relaxed person about how i go about racing and um you know before a bsb i'm nervous you know before the race and stuff like that it's just just like a natural experience that i I endure you know just before the before any event but um so yeah i mean I, i don't hate it or you know resist you know that that moment but it's just something that you go through every time and I've, I, I guess I've become used to it you know I've, I've built up a, a a way of dealing with it I know it's coming and it's always there and you just sort of like yeah just let it come and you know that when you get going and you, and you mentally go through that process you go look just chill out you know that as soon as we set off all those nervous energy will just disappear and you'll feel completely at ease again so yeah you just sort of like ride ride through it so just put yourself in that that position you know when when that hand comes off your shoulder what what are your first thoughts what's your first concentration point as you're setting up and releasing that clutch well i mean there's i've never really analyzed it so so deeply but uh i guess you know initially you just like you know feeding the revs and the clutch and you'd want because the gearing for the isle of man tt circuit is tall a first gear start isn't like a bsb start it's like you've really got to control well, the, the revs and and really concentrate on 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 slipping the clutch for quite a long time it, and it feels like a long time mm. um when, you, when you're doing it you're like god is it not is it not picked up enough and and sometimes you get impatient and you think oh it's got to be enough and then you let out the clutch a little bit too much and then you lose right. revs and, and yeah. it kind of bogs a little bit and then so yeah that feels like such a drawn out process to just to get off the line and get going and then you're just going through the gears and building up speed and building up speed and you know and then you just start you know picking your points and your markers and you know next thing you're at the um, bottom of bray hill and then you're up over lago's leap and then you you're breaking down into quarter bridge and then you're looking for braden you know i mean it's just it's just you're going through the the processes and um yeah but literally as, as soon as as soon as you set off it's more like a mechanical mechanism that you're so used to doing it's it's it just happens instinctively so before the tt before British Championship before World Championship, Josh Brooks was back in Australia, mm. not coming from, from what I understand, not coming from a, a family with any background in racing. So how did the the whole thing start? Where did the fascination with motorbikes come from? So my dad was just like a social rider. He had motorcycles and things like that, and he rode on the road, and he would ride off-road and, and things. So then um, when I've got an older brother, four years older. So when he was young, he um, bullied my dad into getting him a motorbike. So then when I was born, there was already motorbikes there. The path was already paved, you know, so I just just followed what was already there. And I kind of um, idolized my brother a little bit. I think most kids do, you know, when you got, I think the age gap's important, but when Mm. when he was like, he's four years older. So everything he did, I wanted to do the same. If he had blue shoes, I wanted blue shoes, you know, and if he could do a jump on his BMX bike, I wanted to be able to do a jump on my BMX bike. You know, I said, I just followed and I had this like example that was, and, and often he would bully me into doing more than I was capable of doing as well, which as it turns out was a good thing. At the time he would say things like, oh, do that jump or I'll punch you, you know? And then so I think, all right, if I don't do it, I'll get punched. And if I do do it, well, there's a chance I'll make it and And, and you always want to and show succeed. off to your, to your older siblings did, as well. Did he race? You? Yeah, yeah, he raced, yeah. Yeah, he did um, motocross and did uh, a few years in. Did you race against each other? Yeah, we did, yeah. And was that as competitive as it was back home? Um. Well, I I kind of um, really took to road racing. So he was, um, I think, for a long time, age difference was a, was a, was what made him obviously a lot better than me in motocross because I was always at age group catching up. And then when I got to sixteen, um, I went to road racing, and he did as well. And then, um, 
but by then the age gap wasn't really critical anymore and um i really took to to road racing well so then all of a sudden the deficit was was realigned you know and then um at that point uh he was working full time and kind of um you know trying to balance work and and racing and whereas at that time my dad was sort of i was still getting full support from dad to do it um he had more faith in you than your brother that's what you're saying <laughs> um <laughs> see the way i'm reading that is he got his backside kicked up motocross but he had to go to road racing yeah yeah, that, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, my brother's a bit rebellious you know he didn't really want to do the the discipline and 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 what it took to go racing so my dad had kind of like i wouldn't say lost interest but he was like he wasn't going to invest in him if he wasn't going to invest in himself you know what i mean like mm -hmm. he didn't have the right attitude and and yeah and and sacrifice and he was like happy to go and hang out with his mates and go partying and drinking and, and enjoy being young where um i was happy to you know um sacrifice all those things in focus of of being a racer i purely wanted to race motorbikes all my life so, so that was it that and that was the difference like mm -hmm. so my dad sort of went well if you want to do it do it on your own to prove you want to do it whereas i had full support from dad so because you were um, putting 100 percent because i was putting 100 percent in and that was absolutely what i wanted to do and um and that's where it sort of it sort of took a divide and then my brother got injured as you do with racing and he was like look i've just need to focus on going to work and, and drawing an income and mm -hmm. he didn't have that desire to be a, a a world champion as i did at the time you know so he was happy to to let the motorbike sort of dream sort of drift off how difficult was it you know um obviously road racing as a youngster in, in oz um how difficult was it to build yourself up and try and get to world championship in australia I, I want to say it's really difficult, but I, I mean, you'd have to ask my dad that because he, yeah. he he made the most sacrifices really for us kids as we were growing up. You know, he, we didn't come from a really wealthy background or anything like that. He just worked hard mm -hmm. and give us everything that, that he could. And um, I, I, I guess, you know, I work for everything that I've got out of racing, I believe. But in a way, I would say I was lucky as well because I was racing 125s. Um, in the GP category, so the RS125, Dad had bought that, and um, I'd done most of it, like, because I got a good mechanical understanding. I did a lot of the prep work for the bike, so we didn't have to have a huge outlay in expenses that way. And, you know, we did all the traveling um, as cheaply as we could, you know, with a van or a trailer. And um, I got second in the 105 championship, just narrowly missed uh, winning on my foot, like, you know, as a first attempt it was quite a good mm -hmm. achievement so i kind of got a bit of recognition there but at that point that was 2000 um i had this idea i was going to go 105s 250s 500s that was sort of like the grand prix route that i wanted to wanted to take and um but by 2000 it already changed from two, two strokes to four, four strokes, strokes in, yeah. in motor gp mm -hmm. so already the line was blurred and i was like i was too big for a 125 we couldn't afford to run a 250 the 250 category was pretty much dead in australia mm -hmm. by 2000 so um i dabbled a little bit in production racing with like a an rs 250 aprilia you know like super yeah. teens in here had the 125 mm -hmm. class in australia they ran the 250s and it was um a 250 product proddy class we yeah. called it and um so i dabbled in that a little bit trying to figure out which direction was best to go and my heart wanted to go the grand prix route but my mind was telling me it was a dead end you know so um we ended up buying um a couple of uh gsxr 600s at the time for the 2001 um super sport championship and um so i just yeah just sort of like dropped the two-stroke grand prix route and went super sport and i won the championship full privateer um just me and dad and we had a sponsor a guy kind of come in and um he said look you know we'll i'll try and help you with some of the costs and he actually paid for the bikes initially and then he owned the bikes at the end of the year so it was like a, a really good sort of balance of um of getting that that super sport year started and because i won the championship um i got a professional paid ride the, the following year in superbike so in, in australian superbike yeah in australian superbike so um at that time though in 2001 um there was two series in australia so there was the australian superbike series and then there was a another promoter running what they called a former extreme series so because i won the opening round of super sport um, i then got asked if i wanted to ride a superbike in the other series so they didn't clash mm -hmm. so i rode super sport in australian championship and superbike in the former extreme championship and that was like, 
yeah, I mean, like the 2000 was my first proper year in racing and on a 105 and the following year I was racing oh, super a super bike. You know what I mean? It was, it was a wild um, ride and I just feel like, obviously I did the work to get where I got, but I feel lucky that that path those doors opened Open for itself, me. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because if those doors hadn't opened, it might have been a really yeah. difficult story. You know that you know that we struggled and had to walk away and abandon mm. the idea of going racing. How is the the, the path through Australian superbikes? Because we see a lot of and we saw a lot of riders like yourself eventually end up in the UK. Is yeah. is there a is there a plateau that you reach in Australia that you just can't get to that next step of world superbikes or? without coming to the UK or Europe? Yeah, I just think the, that Australia doesn't um, create the interest from from international teams mm. and, and, and from European championships. So you kind of have to move away from Australia to get some recognition. Um, I, I believe that the championship is very strong in that the riders, you know, the, the lap times that they're doing, the, the riders that are there, you know, it's not as deep as like 15 deep or 20 deep as you see in BSB. Um, the depth isn't there like that, but at least say that like the first five or six, you know, are of of that quality and that mm -hmm. standard. Um, and every year there's you know new people trying to you know bridge that gap and come in. So there is always a quality of of, of riders in Australia, but um, it doesn't have the television coverage like the BSB has, and mm -hmm. it, um, so then it doesn't have the sponsors. So then there's no there's no, it's not promoted properly. Australian Motorcycle. Uh, Federation doesn't have, I, I think, the the right um, view for where the championship should should go, and and the methods of how to how to take it somewhere better. So then you just end up with, um, you know, a van or a, or a trailer type race teams. They've got no, um, you know, uh, paneling in the garage to promote the sponsors well. So yeah. it kind of looks like, you know, a club level. Um, you know, it doesn't look much different to a, a track day you'd see you yeah. know, at, at a circuit here, and that's the, the Australian Championship. So um, there's been times when the factories <clears throat> have kind of got involved. So you'd see, you know, proper articulated trucks, you know, yeah. turning up with, you know, um, mechanics and, you know, well, well presented bikes and, and, and so on. But it sort of like comes in waves, like one minute, you know, the, the championship's there's like, a bit of money there it's and building then, yeah. and then and then some teams will drop out and then they'll come back again and they'll drop out again mm. and then. Um, so at what point through all that did you go, that's the route I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go to Europe. Was that on your mind um, when you first started road racing? Cause I guess. Yeah, I didn't really know. Honestly, I didn't really think about it that much. At, right. at first I was just fixated on, right. I, I've got a win in Australia. You know, that's that's the first target. Let's yeah. try and win there. And I won, and, and it was a bit of a rocky kind of pro, pro, process to that. So I won the Super Sport Championship in, in 01, as I mentioned. And then I got a, a, a proper professional ride in 02. Um, and then I ended up second in the championship that year. So then um, I was like, well, I've got to win. You know, second is still second. You know, I mean, this, that, why go all over, over the other side of the world to get beat when I can get beat at home? You yeah. know, what I mean, it's far closer and it's more. Easier. Yeah. So, if you just want to get beat, yeah, just stay at home. Yeah. So I was like, right, I've got to, I've got to win. So then, oh three, I got injured just before the season and it didn't work out. So then, oh four was looking really good. Um, I was leading Supersport and and for oh. Um, three oh four oh five. I rode six hundred and superbike in the same championship. So okay. I'd, I'd ride, you know, both categories in the weekend. So um, uh, in oh four, I was leading supersport. Um, I was leading superbike. Uh, I got a wild card to race in the world supersport, and I won that. And I, it just felt like this is I, I'm in on, Australia. Yeah, this is all yeah. in Australia. So world supersport, world superbikes came to Phillip Island. Yep. Um, I got a wild card. And my team that I raced for in Australia put my bike on the grid in the World Supersport race, and I won. And so for me, that was that was me on on the on the ramp up towards where I wanted to go. Yeah. And then the following round of the Australian Championship, um, well, actually there was another thing. Uh, Tenkarte uh, got in contact with Honda Australia and said we'd like to um, put Josh on a bike, and, and this was straight away, like in that season. After that, after, after that, that race, yeah. and um, Honda Australia went well. No, we've contracted him to do a job here, so we want him to do that job. You yeah. know, we don't just want to give it, give it, give our you know our our rider away. So, um, so they said no, you can't 
go and do it. So then that must have been a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, it was, but. I was still buzzing by the fact they even got yeah. there was even a consideration. Yeah. So I was thinking, well, if it's not right now, it'll it'll come in some, at some moment uh, ahead. And um, and then at the following Australian Superbike Championship round, I got crashed into by another rider and separated my pelvis. Yeah. So you know I was in hospital for a few weeks and had you know internal fixation, you know, with plates and stuff like that, and then. Um, I was in a wheelchair for a few weeks and then I got to go home and I was on crutches for a few months and then, you know, it was just a long... And so I went from like, yeah, like the peak of my, of at that point, my career and where it was going to mm. like the, the, the lowest trough yeah. of where I've probably ever felt. So, but I think everybody's got a story in racing, you know, there's, there's no, you know, top level athletes that haven't got a story that's similar so um, yeah, so I then so then it was like a new target about well I've got to come back from this and and recover and and get and prove I can be fast again, and um, I even had other like I, the, I, my phone actually rang one day um, and it was a foreign number and I don't know how he got my number I was speaking to a guy and he was speaking in like like broken English like half Italian half English and he was saying oh Josh we want you to come and ride the next round of um in the world championship and in the super sport category and I, I was trying to explain to him from my wheelchair broken. that I was in a wheelchair you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean like not in a wheelchair forever but at that point yeah. I, I, I don't think I mentioned the wheelchair I just said I'm sorry I'm, I'm injured you know what I mean and I'm just a young kid thinking like I'm doesn't have a phone call from a guy but i've got to let him down and say that you can do about i it. can't do it. there's nothing i can do about it. i'm injured you know so i suppose the same like you said if you if you're going to get beat you may as well stay in australia but if you're going to get crashed into screw it you may as well go to europe and, <laughs> and be on the big scene yeah Otherwise, well then um safer. well then i didn't think about it exactly like that you can get crashed into anywhere that yeah. can happen anytime but um so yeah, I got I got recovered and at the end of um 04 I did a a local race um against doctor's orders but you know I, I just wanted to I didn't want to go into like the the off season for another couple of months without yeah. riding because at, at the end of that season I was like well I could probably you know just do a do a race just to like feel my way back in. So I rode 600 super sport only and um I think I got I think I got third in that race or at least the first one I got third. But anyway, um, I was back on the bike and, you know, up to speed and I felt, right, I haven't lost anything. My head, I haven't lost yeah. it. My body's a bit sore, but, you know, I'll, I'll be okay. So then in 05, um, I won both categories, super sport and super bike in, in the same year. So then I was like, right, so that's that box ticked. I'd set off Job years done. ago to yeah. do this journey and I've done what I, what I set out to do and prove that I've, done enough to sort of say right that's australia box ticked i now need to go and i can justify moving going that next level but also you have to have um enough money to support yourself to do that so in in winning the championship and the money i'd earned through my contract it was i had like this nest egg of like right that's that's the money i'm going to take to You're to get to me overseas over that, yeah. and i can i can live and pay for myself for, for a year to get get my foot in the door so that's when i um I had a, had a friend who was um, taking, let's say, like a, a manager's role, like rather than me ringing people saying, "Oh, hello, have you got a ride for yeah. me?" I said, "You know, would you would you help me out and ring some people and say, you know, you represent me?" So that was sort of like the the relationship we had and the basis we went on. And he rang loads of teams, and it was unfortunate. There was a there was a I spent most of the off season thinking I was going to ride for Claffy Honda. Mm -hmm. uh, in World Superbike with um, Max Neukirchner as a teammate. And that was like all what we were hearing was yeah. going to happen, you know, through, because I was obviously well established with Honda Network in Australia um, and they were trying to, um, you know, use their network to, to find a place so I'd stay in the Honda family sort of thing. And that was what we were hearing was going to happen. And I hadn't signed a contract, but it was all where we were going. But yeah. Uh, Alex Barros got dropped out of or ended up without a ride in MotoGP and I don't know the the politics of it all but he ended up in that position and took the Claffy place with um, money from Brazil or whatever because you know remember the Barros always had the Brazil flag yeah. on the side of the bike so at the end of end, either end of December January or start of January it was like oh sorry we don't have that position for you anymore so that was like oh you know like yeah it's big like feel like this massive hole in, yeah. your, in your chest you know so 
Um, then we started on the phone again, running around chasing. I ended up getting a ride with um, uh, Bitoki Kawasaki. No, sorry. I started out with um, Stefano Karaki in Karaki mm-hmm. Ducati. So I did a few rounds with them. Um, and then, yeah, it, di- it didn't work out. And then I went on to Bitoki Kawasaki and then that didn't work out. Well, it worked out and then I finished the season. And then the following year, it got bought out with a new investor. And then um, that ended up in a court battle with the previous owner, Bataki. So then I bailed out of that and ended up with Stiggy uh, Motorsports and World Supersport and finished the year there. And the following year, which was 08, um, I got third in the world championship to uh, Andrew Pitt and Johnny Ray, who were both on 10 Cape bikes. Yeah. You, know, you know, everyone knows how successful they were. So to come third to them two guys was i felt like right that's that's enough that should get me you know yeah. a, a secure you know world championship position you know hopefully that's the end of the the turmoil that i've sort of come through so when you left australia to, to go off to world championship was that you on your own was that you and amy you, your now yeah. wife at the time did you did you just go solo away into europe and live on your own or yeah no i was i was absolutely on my own um i didn't that's meet big, amy until yeah you know to leave everything and, and but when up. you got your heart set on something so much it doesn't you don't really think about it. i'd never even even give it a thought a consideration mm. i mean obviously it was a step but it was just like um i never i never even thought that was a hurdle that was just something you had to do yeah i had to do like yeah. I, from years of like I, i've thought about being a motorbike racer since i was a little kid so um, even though you don't think about every step, you, you do at some point, even as a little kid, know that, well, if I'm going to race in the world championship, I'm going to be somewhere else in the world. Mm-hmm. So traveling just must be part of it, you know. So I didn't really see, although it was a challenge and as, you know, I can speak about it looking back now and realize that it was actually quite a, a big challenge. At the time going that way, I didn't think it was a big deal. I didn't meet Amy until 2011. So it was a long time racing and traveling essentially you're on talking my own. like that's a bit of a weight off your shoulders weight off your shoulders not until later no 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 it's <laughs> <laughs> I hope it didn't come across like that no it was quite the opposite like Amy's taken a huge weight off my shoulders um, by being part of my uh, yeah. racing so she does so much in the background which allows me just to be a motorbike racer and um, yeah so, so at this time me. obviously you know steaming through the, the Australian championship and uh, with massive injuries, obviously, and mm. then bouncing back, being successful, world championship. At any part of this time in your career, was the Alaman TT ever on the radar? Nothing. I knew of it, just, yeah. you know. I, like, and how big was it then in Australia, you know, was it? I don't I don't remember. Like, I mean, I'm sure if you spoke to the right people, they would, they would, um, they would, me- would have mentioned it. But um, where it is interesting, when I, when I spoke about when I first went into Supersport and had a sponsor, he was a British-born guy who, who'd migrated over to Australia and, and lived there. And um, he, had, he, had, he raced himself, but was just, and he won't mind me saying it, was a back marker. He was, he was racing around, enjoying being a racer. And, um, and that's where he noticed me. And obviously I was a young kid coming through and he thought, oh, this kid seems to have some talent. And, he, and I spoke to him regularly just because you speak to lots of people in the paddock, you know, and maybe I came across um, as a decent young kid and he said, look, I'd like to help you. And he actually came and, and rode the Isle of Man TT a few times. Oh, did he? Yeah, he would put all his bikes in crates and, and send them over to the Isle of Man and fly over and ride in the Isle of Man and then come back. And he, I remember him saying to me, oh, when, when I was racing, he, was, he would obviously be um, excited to tell me about being in the Isle of Man and, and what it's like and and the racing and it and he said oh promise me you'll never ride the isle of man whatever you do <laughs> promise me you'll never. and I, at the time i didn't really know about it i knew what he was doing i knew it was like a street yeah. race on the other side of the world from where we were at mm. the time but i never really thought about it much you know obviously like i said i I'd thought about this grand prix i wanted to be in grand prix that's where i was from a kid you know when you got inspiration from like mick Doohan, you know winning five world championships in yep. 500 you know i mean it's hard not to be gravitated towards that and um so I did feel like I was kind of in this sort of like whirlwind of like where my career's taken me. I know I'm, I'm, I want to go up, but I don't know up to where, you know, and I don't know how to get there. So I was sort of like going where, where my career would take me. I wasn't really just steering it. Be, yeah, yeah. I was sort of like just doing the best I could with the moment that I was in, and I didn't really know where it was, was going to go. 
but as a beautiful story that it's become, I ended up in BSB because of that 2008 year in World Supersport. I got third, but I didn't have a really good contract for the following year. I was kind of, I'm still Australian. I still can't get sponsorship easily. I still can't generate um, sponsorship f- um, money to, to bring to a team or, you know, I mean, there's always, there's always seems to be like financially a struggle when you, you come from Australia. So, um, so I end up in this situation where um, I had an opportunity to join um, HM Plant Honda at the time. And yeah, so I dropped into, into British Superbikes and that first year, 09, it was, um, I got invited to come to the Isle of Man TT and then once I come here, I was like, wow, I'm going to do this. You know what I mean? It was just, it wasn't like I had to have time to think about it. I literally walked into the paddock and um, just, yeah. I, I think I t- I've spoken about this before on the podcast. Like you, I walked in and I saw, um, you know, like the, the, the truck that I'd normally operate out of at a BSB. And I saw the mechanics walking around that I'd normally work with. So like your your senses are, are, are going, like you can smell the tires and you can see familiar faces and you can, you, you're, like you're at, at a racetrack environment. So your body, all your, your sensories are going off like normal, mm. like you would, and you're so used to doing every weekend at, at BSBs. So all of those things were sort of like heightening my emotions of, oh, we're at a motorbike race. But then, you realize I, I, I'm just a spectator you yeah. here, you know? So then when I walked up and because being lucky enough to be part of the, the Honda, you know, team and, and racing, I had um, passes to go straight up into the holding area. So then I'm stood at that gate just up at the, at the start finish area and it's, it's a live track. So bikes are like through and I was just yeah. like, it was like a matter of seconds. It went from like, I'm just here as a spectator to, well, oh, I wonder when I'll do this. That's you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I didn't know when it was going to happen, but it was almost like a switch. I was like, oh, I'm going to do this, and yeah, and that, perfect. That's, that's how, how was there any up. negatives from the other half or so, any other family members for competing? Well, I never, I never asked. I'm sure if I'd asked and said to people, "Oh, what do you think if I did that?" I never even asked anyone else. I'm very selfish like that. I'm like, this is, and I, unfortunately, I think you have to be selfish in to be successful. I think in, in, whether it's a business or, or whether it's motorsport or any sport to get to the top you have to be um yeah i I mean there's better ways to describe it but you have to be selfish you've got to i think a better description is single-minded you know you've got to you've got to focus on what you want to do and i think if i asked everyone i knew i'd get a load of oh no i don't think you should and then you start to go oh well if everyone's saying i shouldn't then maybe i shouldn't but i didn't give anybody the chance i'd sort of just made my mind up what i wanted to do and set about doing it so before we get into the whole tt career and the future of, of you, your TT, the amazing start you've had to the BSB. We're going to end part one here. Maybe we should get Amy on for part two and ask her what, what her feelings were when you said you were going to go and start with TT. You can if you like. I think she'll <laughs> shake her head and say no. <laughs> well, will end it there. Cheers, Josh. Thank you.